All right, next up on our agenda, we have Madeline Dieppe of Fraunhofer USA CMA presenting on an NLP-based approach for requirements review of flight software requirements. And Madeline, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, first I'd like to thank the opportunity to talk about our work. Uh, our work is sponsored by the NASA Software Assurance Research Program. And it's really about um, improving requirements review process for the software assurance engineers and to look for uh, you know, state-of-the-art um, techniques and tools to do that. So in which, in this case, uh, we're utilizing the natural language processing um, to do that, to achieve that. Uh, so I want to acknowledge my collaborators. Uh, uh, we, I, we, work, we work closely with uh, Ying Shi from the NASA Goddard and uh, my colleague, uh, Michael Linvall, who is also from Fraunhofer. Right. So uh, what, what motivates our work? Um, I hope that I, I don't really have to convince anybody in the room that the importance of requirements and getting requirements right early in the development process. Um, however, regardless of the importance of requirements and the efforts that um, NASA put together in terms of, you know, uh, detecting requirements issues earlier, they found that requirements flaws are still a major contributor to software defect. So uh, the latest uh, survey that was done by the IVNV uh, Center and NASA shows that uh, from the number of defects that they, they looked at uh, for the root cause, they found that almost half of uh, the, the issues can be attributed to requirements. And now looking into of that a little bit more closely, uh, they, you know, they, they bucketed the, the, the root cause to various categories, uh, and they're only looking into severity one and severity uh, two issues. Um, and they try to plot, you know, the number of, um, you know, these defects or root cause defects uh, against all these categories. And you can see from the orange bars, uh, which represent uh, the issues that are related to requirements, uh, that the requirements, you know, uh, are some of the, uh, the top ones that, you know, bubble up from this list. So issues like missing requirements, uh, traceability, uh, inconsistent requirements and uh, incomplete requirements are uh, are a concern for uh, for NASA. So why is it difficult, um, or uh, what what is a, the the current uh, state of the art of requirements? Uh, I mean, state of the practice of the requirements review activity uh, by software assurance engineers. So they still tend to be manual and a very uh, requires a lot of effort. And, um, and, and this is, uh, makes sense uh, considering that requirements are written language, uh, you know, a natural language, it's very difficult. Uh, there's a lot of subtlety and interpretations uh, required in uh, reading through and analyzing these requirements. They're still checklist driven, uh, so a lot of the activities are passive. Uh, and regardless, um, you know, there's still interpretation that needs to be done and therefore the effectiveness on, um, how well somebody's performing a requirements review can be also attributed with experience and the domain expertise that they have uh, for you know for that particular uh, projects or missions in which that the requirements uh, are uh, were being analyzed. So the, uh, the 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 overarching objective of our research project is to you know develop a tool set for software assurance engineers then can facilitate uh, their requirements review uh, activity for more efficient and effective re uh, review. So for our particular project, uh, we're strictly or we're mainly focusing on incomplete or inconsistent requirements. It's actually, I, I also want to highlight uh, uh, one of the pre-recorded um, um, uh, presentations that are also in the flight software from another IBM team that's looking into an AI base, um, you know, to perform requirements review. So we, we actually have talked to those teams and, you know, trying to understand uh, the, the complementary approach that we, we have. So I really suggest you to look into uh, to that if you're interested in this uh, topic. So um, kind of focusing on incomplete and inconsistent requirement, uh, issues in the requirements, uh, we came uh, toward these uh, problems with two hypotheses in mind. And these two hypotheses or two approaches we have in mind are really kind of based on our experience, our own experience when we're reviewing requirements uh, documents and recognizing what works and what do not work for us. Um, so the first uh, approach or first hypothesis is to leverage groupings of requirements. 
so in here, the hypothesis is that by looking into a subset of requirements that are related together at the same time, or so relatively, you know, in the short amount of time, um, you know, between one and another, you are most likely you will be able to uh, uh, to be able to find issues with inconsistencies or be able to evaluate completeness of requirements better. And additionally, that we recognize that you know uh, by looking into a smaller number of requirements, it is a much more tractable uh, problems than you know trying to look at the entire documents. But I also want to acknowledge that many of the NASA requirements are actually. Um, uh, they, they have been structured in groups of requirements and they're uh, usually by subsystems of features. And therefore our uh, methods or our uh, approach is trying to look into what other useful groupings out there and um, you know, be able to uh, recognize that maybe the requirements that should be reviewed together can be actually placed for, far apart from uh, uh, of each other in, within the document itself. So the second approach that we looked at uh, is really kind of motivated or inspired by a modeling approach, which is like a state diagrams, in which that, you know, we recognize that in NASA domain, at least, um, there are many capabilities that are complementary or comes in pair or comes in the set. You know, so for example, you know, functionality like opening a file, uh, usually accompanied by, you know, a functionality of closing the file, you know, opening a socket, closing a socket. So, uh, so we, you know, we focus on this kind of patterns, which we call the complementary requirements. And we would like to investigate whether by looking into these complementary uh, antonyms or requirements, uh, whether it can provide a systematic way to assess requirements and finding issues with completeness and inconsistencies. So just kind of uh, being a little bit more concrete, uh, shown down there are actually two requirements that come from uh, one of the flight software, uh, core flight software requirements, which is one of them talks about, you know, capability to upload software Im image and uh, what we consider to be a complementary requirements in this case is uh, the capability to retrieve a software image. So again, just to, uh, to summarize then, uh, our research project is to try to use natural language uh, programming to automatically group and identify complementary antonyms and requirements. And being a research uh, project in itself, you know, uh, this is, you know, we come in not 100% uh, sure that this is all gonna work. Uh, so part of the, the activities in here is really to explore, you know, what kind of groupings that we had actually established uh, with an LP, especially in the context of, you know, NASA requirements um, can, and evaluate really kind of the, the, the extent of uh, NLP, um, you know, techniques in order to uh, ac accomplish our, you know, our task. So the, the, the second, um, you know, objectives that we, ha we have is to actually develop a tool that encompasses these ma methods and approaches. And um, I like to throw back to Dr. Dresman, um, you know, talk earlier today that the purpose of this tool is not to replace a human, it's not to replace the software assurance uh, engineers in their activity. So NLP should be the means to an end and not to the end itself. Uh, so what we believe is that, you know, what, uh, what we want to explore is that what kind of information and how we can represent information that you know, provide recommendations and suggestions to the SAE so that they can look at these requirements with accompaniment informations and allow them to do uh, their job um, better uh, and to be able to, to find issues faster. Um, so uh, I use the word NLP a lot. Um, I just kind of want to level set everybody's um, um, uh, perceptions of NLP. Uh, it is, a, a, a for, we consider NLP to be a collection of methods and approaches that will enable computer to analyze and process natural language, uh, either it's spoken or written. And uh, some of the most common NLP applications out there is it's being used for, you know, part of speech tagging, breaking down sentences, its own elements, and kind of tag the types of word that made up a sentence. Uh, for example, you know, sh uh, she is considered PRP or possessive pronouns. Um, and this can be used in other applications such as to extract entities from, uh, from you know, documents such as, you know, uh, identify all the different organizations that show up in a particular docu document. Another popular use of NLP in sentiment analysis being used to, you know, to evaluate, you know, uh, review and feedbacks uh, to see whether they have a favorable or unfavorable uh, opinion of the product. So going back to the use of NLP, uh, so the first task or the first approach that we have is to look at groupings. 
So in this, in this particular task, we explore dif different uh, modeling techniques uh, from NLP. So the first one is the LDA modeling on the latent direct light direct load allocations. So this is more of the traditional uh, modeling or grouping techniques in which that it looks at you know, the frequency of words and the statistical distributions of the words to determine topic groups and then try to allocate or uh, categorize uh, uh, different documents into these groups of topics. So the second modeling technique is a little bit more sophisticated. So it incorporates the, the concept of embedding it recognized that the placement of word or the, the meaning of the word, it really depends on how the words is actually being used in a statement. So for example, you know, uh, the word bucket can mean different things when we say bucket list or kick a bucket. Uh, so this type of modeling differentiates the meaning of the word and therefore trying to make grouping based on, um, uh, 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 based on the contextuals uh, of the word. So finally, we kind of, went back very basic and tried to do groupings uh, based on just things that are very straightforward, you know, whether the, 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 the requirements share verbs, shared nouns, you know, share uh, a subject noun, object noun, and adjective. Because this is kind of really the typical, um, you know, process that, you know, people might leverage when they review requirements and they're trying to bucket things by common, com commonalities. So in terms of the complementary antonym analysis, uh, so our approach is basically made of three types, which is the first one is, can we identify requirement statement, statements which may have complementary antonyms? And then the second, if they do, uh, then can we identify what are the complementary words? And the third one, then when we know what's a complement, possible complementary words, can we identify if the, the complementary sentence of the or the complementary requirements actually exist within the document. So for the first steps, uh, identifying statements that may have complementary antonyms, we went back and went through a number of requirements documents and tried to you know, mark things, evaluate things, uh, re evaluate requirements that we felt should have a, a complementary uh, pairings or sets. And we, uh, we, and we extract uh, those words and um, you know, kind of make a dictionary out of it. So in terms of the identifying the complementary words, we thought that we could rely on NLP libraries that provide us with you know, antonyms of a word. But that turned out to be not very successful uh, because you know, the, the, the wording is NASA domains is very specific and, um, and going to, uh, using more of out of the box uh, NLP libraries that provide antonyms words actually leads to a lot of false positive and false negatives. So for example, in the earlier one, uh, I mentioned that um, uh, we have, um, you know, uh, uh, two requirements, upload, and um, now I cannot remember, I think it's retrieve, right? But when you see the table here, um, you know, using the NLTK library, the only words that associated with upload is a download. And by using other libraries, you know, it, it comes up with a large numbers of possible words, but they are still not what the NASA uh, documents use. So what we use instead, you know, again, we extract this dictionary of uh, words and their antonyms, and we use them in our analysis for complementary words. Um, so I'm gonna skip this uh, slides and just kind of straight to show uh, what the tool looks like or uh, what we built from, you know, these two approaches. Uh, so I apologize for, you know, the small text, and I don't expect anybody to be able to read any of the text here. Uh, but this is really kind of ingestions of one of the uh, core flight software requirements documents. So you can kind of see the table shows, um, you know, uh, the requirements ID that has appeared in the documents, the requirements text themselves, and then, um, you know, the different groupings that, you know, the, the different methods or grouping methods that we use place each of these uh, requirements. So it's a lot of inform information and part of the research that we're doing is to kind of really understand is this information useful for the SIE? Do they appreciate having this information or are these really just, you know, we'll take them to yet another place and not very use um, uh, useful for the requirements review activity. But also what we use here is really just also debugging to make sure that we're, you know, we're doing things the right way. Um, there's, of course, you know, the typical search functionality, and this is very helpful that, you know, if you want to make sure that this phrase really not exists in these documents, you can just search and, you know, be able to pull the documentations. 
Um, so they have a columns in which that, you know, we analyze each requirements and try to flag them in terms of whether it has complementary or not, and it provides the result in that columns. But we also have an analysis in which that, you know, if we think that this requirement should have a complementary requirements, but we don't find it in documents, then it will flag them as missing. So kind of going into this uh, requirements a little bit more, then we can have a little bit more detail about this requirement. So this requirement here is considered uh, has a, a, um, a suggestion to be looked at because there might be a missing requirements because there's no complementary requirements can be found here. Um, so it is considered com complementary requirements because invalid is one of our keywords to determine uh, a complementary requirement. And you can see um, here that you know, there's two different scenarios that could happen. It could be that the tool incorrectly identified those requirements have complementary requirements. It could be that the tool unable to identify the complementary requirements because it's complementary requirements in written in such a way that the tool are not able to you know, relate them together. Or it could really be uh, a defects in the requirements documents that represents a missing requirement. So, um, so the the other features that you know this tool provides then you know lacking these complementary requirements can we show all the similar requirements? So I should go back and said that you know what we found that groupings in itself is not very useful. Each of the method groupings, a lot of them produce groupings that may not be as meaningful. But what we found to be very useful is that using kind of assemblies of these methods. So incorporating all the seven techniques together, you know, trying to determine uh, this um, sorry this this match. Um, you know, match values. So where, you know, the most similar requirements will bubble up on the top because they're, they're, they're considered to be in the same grouping as the, the focus of requirements here. So in here that, you know, also we can flag requirements and mark them or make a note of those requirements. So the other thing that we found useful is that, you know, uh, NLP uh, computer makes mistakes. So it could be that this particular requirements actually do have its complementary requirements, but the tools fail to do it. So in the effort to be able to continuously learning from, you know, uh, from, from experience that we allow the tool to manually mark and keep track of those occasions in which that a, a user has to manually mark uh, requirements. Um, in some of the documents, um, for NASA documents are very famous for the hierarchical uh, structure and our tools you know, treat each of the requirements per line as its independent, you know, requirements. So therefore, there are certain situations in which that, you know, for, for particular in, in here, we can see that, you know, it lists all the child uh, requirements and they look similar because we're losing some context of the parents. So we also provide, you know, um, kind of more apparent uh, child relationship so you can see a little bit deeper in, into that. All right, so I'm gonna skip this one. Um, so we applied this tool to many different requirements, including Roman Space Telescope, but for the particular purpose for this, uh, you know, I just want to show for the two open source uh, requirements documents that belong to, for core flight software. So what we found, uh, so it's actually in general, uh, the, the technique works pretty well in identifying complementary requirements. So for example, in here, the requirements are correctly, you know, uh, identified this the requirement to have complementary requirements and to identify uh, the, the complement, complementary requirements correctly. So for the other ones here, um, so it's actually flagged as to have a missing complementary because it's looked for the enabled and it couldn't find a disabled uh, that's close enough for this requirement. So um, this is actually kind of interesting because you, know, you can look into the similar requirements. Uh, it, it shows some conditions in which that power on power on initialization state is set to enabled, but we couldn't really find requirements in which that is set to disabled. Um, so an SAE in this case can ponder and see whether, you know, uh, using their expert uh, knowledge to determine whether is this really an issue or is it a non-issue. So another one's uh, usefulness of this tool, you know, because it but it groups similar requirements, uh, a number, a, a small number of requirements on the top. So you can look into similar requirements all in the same page, all in the same uh, close, uh, in a close proximity to each other. So you can see in here that the requirements are actually placed uh, in the separate, you know, they're not sequential in the document uh, requirements documents, but all of them are related to the situations in which the requirements has invalid conditions. 
So you can look into these groups of requirements and determine uh, and look for inc inconsistencies. For example, some of the requirements specify skipping the table as uh, a response to these conditions, while all the other uh, requirements are not. And only one requirement explicitly say uh, to, to specify error message. All the other requirements only say event message. So you can look into the evaluate this and uh, make sense of whether you know, this consistency could be become an issue in the implementations of these requirements. So I know I'm running uh, behind on my time. So just to conclude, um, so what we found is that, you know, they are very useful, uh, but it does require subject matter expertise to, to perform. Uh, our complementary analysis uh, works good in some documents, but are not. We are still observing a lot of false positive and true negatives. Uh, and this uh, indicate that we might have to go with more complex patterns uh, in order to be able to um, identify complementary analysis. Uh, complemented, complementary requirements. And uh, finally, I think one of the main challenge in here is that, you know, uh, finding the starting point uh, is still challenging. We need more heuristics that can point users to the more interesting requirements. Uh, for example, some of our experience shows that, you know, a high number of very similar requirements tend to uh, be very useful in identifying completeness and inconsistency. So can we encode that within our tools so that we can point an SAEs to requirements that might have a high number of very similar requirements? And finally, uh, so that's the end of my talk. And again, I just wanna acknowledge the uh, NASA SART program for funding, funding this work. Thank you so much, Madeline. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions and got one already in from Peter Fiddleman. Have you tried writing the requirements in a more constrained way that would make the NLP's job easier, for example, using the ears pattern? Yes, uh, actually, one of the uh, requirements documents that we looked at are, were, are specified in an ear syntax. Um, and in, in general, uh, we do think that requirements that are specified in the ears uh, syntax, um, you know, actually, you can identify better groupings with them. And you can actually, you know, the NLP works better for those uh, types of documents compared to the documents that are uh, do not, you know, are not written in uh, in more a structured uh, template. Okay. Um, uh, next question from Alexandra Holloway. The need for this tool points to a fundamental problem in requirements authoring and tracing. Will you be feeding your work's results back to that area? Well, uh, for this particular one, um, not, uh, but I know that the work by the other IBNV folks, uh, the one that I promote during my talk, do actually look into traceability very extensively and, you know, trying to, you know, create this parent and child relationships with their tool. And uh, I mean, we did talk about kind of combining our work, you know, essentially this work is going to feed in into their tool uh, because, you know, they, they spend a lot of their effort in building actually a robust tool. Um, so we hope that, you know, with that, um, by incorporating our work into their tools, you know, we can leverage from their traceability work and, you know, um, fits into the gaps that we don't currently have. Okay, great. Uh, time for one last uh, real quick question from Steve. Did you find did you find that use of ears helped the requirements authors avoid missing requirements versus requirements not written with the structure? Um, so this is an interesting <laughs> because actually we, we have a past uh, work with also with the SARP in which that we actually uh, promote the use of ears. Uh, so we, we are believer of ears and we, uh, we, we, we do think that ears are very useful for, you know, in the requirements writing and it helps in, um, you know, just in principle to, to help, you know, incompleteness, um, you know, um, avoid incompleteness in the requirements. Uh, I'm not sure that's really kind of answer the questions, but, uh, but, but yes, I, we, we do think that ears will be useful. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, we're out of time. I think we can uh, uh, move some of the last other discussion points over to the Slack if you're over there. Um, thank you so much, Madeline. Thank you.